The energy of light was related to the um, amplitude of light or how bright the light was, okay? And that's uh, kind of true in sort of a total um, aspect. You know, the brighter the light, the higher the energy, if it's the same wavelength, okay? We also have to take in the wavelength um, to occur, okay? Um, and one of the first experiments or um, I guess reasons we had to think about that uh, wavelength and frequency impacted uh, uh, energy was the photoelectric effect. Okay, so what's the photoelectric effect? Okay, so you could have a photoelectric material. Okay, Ooh. photo. All right, so what's a photoelectric material? Well, it depends on the material. Of course, different materials are photoelectric. Uh, most metals are photoelectric. Uh, semiconductors like silicon is a uh, photoelectric material. And that will come in uh, handy later when we talk about it. So what happens? Okay, what's a photoelectric material? All right, so um, a photoelectric material, what happens? Okay, so we got a, well, let's draw this. Of course. What's that? That's a light bulb. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I was actually excited that you knew what that was. Okay, I admit my uh, light bulb drawing skills, especially on a tablet, are not that great. That's just not a great light bulb. But I'm so excited you knew what that was, or at least most of you. Some maybe not. That's okay. All right. So if you have a light bulb next to a photoelectric material and it uh, shines light on that photoelectric material, what happens is once that light of certain frequencies of certain energy uh, will cause the photoelectric material to actually, to actually emit or eject electrons. Okay, so light hits this photoelectric material. The electric material, photoelectric material absorbs that light and shoots off an electron. That's called the photoelectric effect. All right, so that happens. Okay, that could be the end of the story. But it turns out that's a pretty awesome thing that happens. Okay, we actually use those, um, this process, photoelectric effect, quite a bit. Okay, so in experiment seven, Remember experiment seven? Who could forget experiment seven? Determination of copper plus two ions in solution using spectrophotometry. Ring a bell? Wasn't that fun? All right. Uh, remember you, uh, you made your solutions copper plus two, you put them in a spectrophotometer, and the spectrophotometer was shining light through them. We were detecting how much light went through, okay, the absorption. Okay, how do we detect that light? We have a photomultiplier tube that uses the photoelectric material, or photoelectric effect to do that. So light gets through the solution, hits the detector, the detector is a photoelectric material, it shoots off an electron and we measure that current. And the higher the current, the more electrons it shoots off, the more light hits it, the, higher, the lower the absorbance. Okay, all right, <clears throat> that's one way that we use the photoelectric effect. And from the looks, you're not that impressed. Okay, it's okay. I'll think of other things that we use the photoelectric for. Have you ever taken a digital photograph? A Polaroid? No, a digital photograph. Have you ever taken a digital photograph? Yes. You have? I think so. You think so? Are you sure? I'm not sure. You're not sure? Have you ever taken a digital photograph? Yes, you have. With what? With your camera? A cell phone? Okay, so that, you're thinking Polaroid, that's analog. That's film. That's a film, photographic film, okay? Of course, we don't use photographic film too often these days. You can, you can go old school, okay? Um, but how does, a, how does a digital camera work? Hey, guess what? It uses the photoelectric effect. Okay, so if you're, if you're, in, the, uh, if you're in the market for a camera that can take digital photographs, Okay, um, what would be some properties that you would uh, look for in a good camera? Megapixel. 
megapixels, the resolution of the camera, how, the, how it does for light. So megapixels, okay? So how many megapixels? 13 megapixels, 15, 16, 8, 2, whatever it is. Okay, so the pixels are actually individual squares on the detector of your camera that are a photoelectric material. And when the light hits those pixels, those pixels emit electrons, and then you detect if the electrons were uh, observed at that uh, pixel. Okay, so obviously the more pixels you have on a photo, the higher the resolution. Okay, but that's how a digital camera works, very simplistically, of course. But so light hits the pixel, the pixel kicks off an electron, the computer processing of your cell phone says, hey, light hit that one. Okay, that's uh, part of his shirt. Let's, let's print that. Okay. All right, so digital camera. And then, of course, uh, another uh, area in which the photoelectric material um, uh, is very important, or photoelectric effect, is for silicon in solar cells. Okay, again, a little bit more simplistic, but essentially this is how uh, solar electricity works. Okay, you get light from the sun, shines on the photoelectric material, the photoelectric material kicks off electrons, uh, what happens if you get electrons being produced and you can use that flow of electrons? That's electricity, the flow of electrons. That's electricity. So essentially, that's how solar cells work as well. So photoelectric effect is very important, okay? But that's, uh, you know, not really why we're talking about it here, okay? Um, at about the turn of the century, early uh, 1900s, not this century, last century, okay, early 1900s, um, the, uh, this was kind of a perplexing event because it turns out that the energy, okay, uh, didn't really depend on how bright the light was, okay? Most initially you would think, okay, the brighter the light, the more electrons you would get, okay? But it turns out that one of the main factors that um, determined whether or not electrons were being kicked off was not the brightness of light, it was actually the frequency, okay? There's a threshold frequency all right, that until you got to that frequency of light, it didn't matter how bright this light was, electrons weren't coming off, okay? But then once you hit that threshold frequency, then suddenly you got electrons. And then the brightness of light matter, okay? The brighter light would make more electrons or produce more electrons, but it still uh, comes off, it only happens after a threshold frequency, okay? So I wanna say photoelectric materials, frequency, okay? And one of the implications of this is that frequency has something to do with energy. Hmm. All right. And one of the first, a couple people to really help out uh, explain this or these two gentlemen. Does anybody know who this is? I'm not sure anybody's gonna know this, but does anybody know who this is? Albert Einstein. That is, that's Albert Einstein. When Very good. When he was young. This is what Albert Einstein looked like when he was doing all of his great work in the early 1900s. One of his papers on the photoelectric effect came out in 1905. That's what he looked like, okay? Nobody ever shows that picture of Albert Einstein. They always show this picture, okay? <laughs> You know, create, you know, old owl, his hair, okay? You know, after I make my discovery, I want people to show the young picture, uh, not the crazy one. Does he look like a, like a mad scientist? He does look like a mad scientist. I'm sure he does want to be, he's, look at it, dapper. Man, look at that tie. He's look. No, I don't have that picture. That's another picture. That's the picture. All right, so Albert Einstein went again when he looked like this. And actually, I should put a younger picture of this gentleman. Does anybody off chance know this? He's less famous, not, not, not in the scientific community, but uh, you know, worldwide is probably less famous. His name is Max Planck, Max Planck. 
Okay, probably maybe that rings a bell. If uh, you go over to Germany, um, one of the premier universities uh, over there is the Max Planck Institute. That's like MIT, Harvard of Germany. Okay, so a very famous physicist. Uh, both of the, these uh, individuals helped explain the photoelectric effect and um, the energy of light, how the energy of light comes on. And I've got a little video that uh, is pretty good that shows this. It's not mine, but all right. So that is, so um, they explained it in terms of cookies, but the actual paper uh, on uh, explaining the energy of light was based on the photoelectric effect. Okay. Um, so what, it, so the, what are the takeaway messages from this? Okay, so we got to distill down that. That was a lot of information. And even the cartoon drawing you saw, most of you, that was crazy old Al, not young dapper Al. All right, so what's the uh, energy of light? So um, it turns out all energy, okay, and this was uh, Max Planck's um, first discovery, energy... is quantized. Okay, what do I mean by that? Basically, it comes in steps. Okay, and that's actually where the name quantum mechanics come from. Okay, it's quantized, it comes in specific quantities. All right, and so uh, we could uh, visualize this if we plot energy of a system, energy of something. I don't know. All right. Uh, classical mechanics would think uh, if you can have uh, in basically an analog representation of energy. The energy just can go up infinitely. And the steps that it can go up can be infinitesimally small. It turns out that's not the case. Okay. Uh, really, how nature works is that energy comes in steps. All right. You can't go anywhere along this line. Okay. If you want to increase the energy of your system, you have to go to the next step. You can't go in here. There's no half steps here. There's no quarter steps here. All right. So that's what quantize means. It comes in specific, discrete steps. Just like the difference between analog and digital measurements, okay? Okay, and then, of course, uh, Einstein took that and basically ran with it and says light, okay? Uh, Einstein said light comes in steps or packets. Which I think they, um, he, I don't know if Albert Einstein did it, um, or just the scientific community, uh, eventually, uh, initially named this quantas. Um, we now refer to that the packets of light or discrete entities of light, we call them particles. They are particles of light, and we call them photons. Particles of light. And sort of the counterintuitive thing of this, and this has started off quantum mechanics uh, down sort of a uh, windy road of complexity, is that gives uh, light both wave-like and particle properties, okay? And that turns out all matter has that eventually. So that means light has wave and particle properties. And what's even nicer is that based on the fact that a uh, individual photon, particle of light, carries the energy of the light, you can calculate the energy of a photon if you know its frequency. And it turns out we've got a new handy dandy equation for that E equals H nu. 
That's my fancy V, so that's a new. Oh, you're quantum photons, the color is different. The camera is the packet of one of the photons. I would say when you're talking about light, uh, nothing. They're not there and they're, they're, there's no difference. You can say a quantum of a light, a photon of light, same thing. Packet, particle. Okay, just different ways. This was the original sort of, I guess, terms they use, packets of light, quanta. Now we just say, hey, it's a particle. It's a it's a distinct object, okay? And we call them photons. All right. And of course, and then the um, the bigger explanation is that quanta can be used a little bit more um, general, like a quanta of anything, a quanta of energy, a quanta of just as an individual step of anything. Photon, if you say anyone talks about photons, they just mean light, particle of light. Photon means light. Okay. <coughs> But if anything, this is what I want you to remember. Photons equals particle of light. Okay. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I don't know if we ever we have an exam on this coming up anytime soon. Uh, yes, sir. Man, time flies when you're having fun. This summer is just going so fast. <laughs> It's I mean, they say, registration's open, summer and fall. All right, so what is this equation? What's the uh, new again, the fancy V? Isn't that frequency? Frequency, good. So that's the frequency. And the H is something new. That is Planck's constant. So Planck got a, nope, there's no C. Got a constant out of the deal, not too shabby, huh? Got a minute, got a YouTube video about him and a constant. Oh, he's famous. Oh, and a very prestigious university. Okay, so what is? Uh, Planck's constant. Well, the physical um, representation of it uh, is kind of hard to, uh, uh, you know, to say simply. But I like to think of it as it's a measure of the steps. Okay, how? What's the steps that energy can come from or come in? And so, six point six. That's a two. Six point six two six times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. We haven't used it quite a lot, so a J is a joule, and it's a unit of energy. That is a negative 34, negative 34. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. Not a joule per second, a joule times second. Why are the moles and the joules 6 point something? What's up with the 6 point? What, I mean, what, where are we getting these numbers from? Uh, so, I mean, I think it's just a coincidence they started out with 6. Um, and I don't... Off the top of my head, I don't know how to experimentally determine Planck's constant. I do know how to experimentally, to experimentally determine uh, Avogadro's number, and it turns out we'll actually do that in Gen Chem 2. Get ready, get excited. <laughs> There's a two in there. If 6.626. Yeah, if they don't put that two in there, like they'll catch on. All right, 6.626 6 times 10 to the negative 34th. Is that a big number or a small number? That's a small number. And so it's not that uh, surprising that for a long time we thought energy was analog, meaning that it can come in any uh, degree. Okay, there's, infinite, there's an infinite number of energy uh, values, but it turns out that nature is quantized. It comes in steps. Okay, um, and this this translates to almost every uh, fundamental measurement 
of the universe. There is a discrete, there is a smallest mass that you can have. There's a smallest time that you can have. There's a smallest unit of distance that you can have. And they're all called Planck's. Planck length, Planck time, Planck mass, Planck, Planck energy. Okay, that's how the, the universe comes. All right, so there's some lights. All right, what kind of light is this? Red neon. Neon. neon light, it is a neon light, okay? Now, I'll turn this off a little bit. All right, so these neon lights, uh, this is a neon light. So anytime you see a glass filled, a gas filled glass tube that's emitting red light, that's a neon light. All right. Um, turns out we use that term neon lights more general than any brightly colored lights you see, you know, out there, uh, you know, on a, in a business strip uh, was neon lights. But if it's the only ones that are actually the element neon are red. Neon emits red light. If it's any other color, it's a different type of light, okay? So this, this fuchsia colored light, that's a hydrogen lamp. So you can take out any element, okay? And you can make a lamp out of it, a light out of it, and it will emit some type of light that turns out is only unique to that element, okay? Um, that's a street light. What's that? It is. I'm just, I'm just helping you guys out. What's that? Does anybody know what the lamps that are? So you always, you've seen those, the kind of a yellowish tinge to them. Does anybody know what type of light, lamp that is? The type of bulb it is? Halogen. No, it's not halogen. It's, it's not that common knowledge, but tungsten is regular light bulbs. Okay. Um, they're called sodium D lamps. Okay, so that's sodium in those lamps that give off that, uh, that yellow light. And if you have um, a gas burning stove and you ever accidentally overboil water and you see water, water will give off a lot of yellow light because of the sodium in the way, especially if you salt the pasta water. Okay? Look at me like I'm crazy, I swear. That happens. Okay, so that's a sodium D lamp. And you can go, we can go on and on about these. Um, you ever see like newer, not newer now, but you know, some car lights have a little bit of blue tinge to them. Okay, those are xenon lamps. Okay, xenon gives off that char characteristic blue lamps. And there's other examples of this, but this um, was a sort of burning question, again, at the uh, turn of the century, is why do these elements give off these types of light? Why does neon always give off red? Why does hydrogen always give off this uh, sort of purplish, pinkish color? Okay, why does sodium give off yellow? Okay, and so at about the same time we were figuring all these things out about light, okay, um, oh, I guess I should show this. These are called emission spectrums, all right? And so these uh, show the individual wavelengths of light that the different elements uh, give off. So here, I should probably should have labeled these, okay? <laughs> Pretty sure this is neon, okay? All the red lights over here, so this is neon. Okay, primarily, it gives out other wavelengths of light, but primarily red, and that's what your eye picks up the most. Okay, this is the hydrogen lamp that you saw down here. It gives off only a few wavelengths of light, a blue, bluish green color, and then a red. And then when those composite of those wavelengths of uh, light hit your eye, that's what you see. You see this color, okay? Just like there's no pink on the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Pink is a combination of wavelengths of light. So this is neon, this is uh, hydrogen, and then here's sodium. So this big sodium, or big yellow emission uh, right here is what gives sodium that yellow tinge, okay? That means that, for example, sodium, right, is mm -hmm. yellow, mm -hmm. but it also gives like green, but yep. like the lesser... Yeah, so this uh, it also tells the thickness of these lines, try to give you an idea of the brightness. And then where they're at on the spectrum gives you the wavelength. These are called emission spectrums. I should explain that a little bit. But it also gives off this yellow, a little bit of green here, some really faint blue lines here. Okay. But this is this spectrum is unique to sodium. This is unique to neon. No other element gives off this same exact emission spectrum. Okay. All right, so. What about LED lights? What are they? LED lights aren't just a specific element. 
Uh, they are a combination of semiconductors, okay? That you can either have, uh, so you'll have, if you look into semiconductor LEDs, they're either a PN, a positive negative junction, or a NP junction. And so they're just mostly silicon, but how they're, so how you create a semiconductor is you dope silicon, um, you add different elements to it, either that have more valence electrons, those are called N negative because they're more electrons, or uh, elements that have less valence electrons, those are called positive P semiconductors. And so when you put those together, a P and an N, or an N and a P, and you conduct electricity through them, you can get them to emit light, different wavelengths of light, depending on the elements. So it's not just one element that does it, the combination of what elements you put in there gives you the different colors of light. Um, that's a good question, but yeah, so eventually, so I'm just talking about the basic, um, you know, the fundamental, it comes down to elements, but then of course you can add elements together and different uh, combinations. Like isotopes, not <laughs> isotopes. So I know there are ways to figure out isotope, different isotopes from emission spectrum, but it's extremely difficult. So the, 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 as soon as I said that, I know you can do it. But um, the, the simple, the general is no. An individual atom uh, isotope will give off the exact, very, very similar. Like, you have to have a very good spectrophotometer to be able to tell the difference. And it's a complex process to do it. AKA, nobody does it that way to figure out isotopes. Okay. Um, so essentially, they will. Any atom will give off the same um, emission spectrum. Okay, um, like these lights. These lights have mercury in them. That's why you shouldn't just throw these complex or fluorescent lights out, you know, in the trash. You got to recycle them properly. Even the compact CFLs that you get at home, the curly ones, you got to recycle those properly because they have mercury in them. And then there's also a phosphorus compound coating the inside. So that combination creates the white light we see here. So it can get more complex. All right. That's poison to breathe in, right? That's why. Yeah, mercury is not too good for you. I mean, it's not that bad. Elemental mercury isn't that bad because it doesn't um, um, evaporate. So if you spill some, as long as you don't breathe in the powder, it's not that bad. So if you sweep it up and dispose of it properly at a proper, like Broward County Recycling Center, um, you know that's okay. But it's not. Yeah, you do have to be careful with those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, that's so. It's not that bad if it's not. Um, because it doesn't evaporate like water does. So it's not that bad, but I mean, if you were to ingest it, yeah, obviously then that's the issue. You didn't eat it, did you? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> that explains. <laughs> that explains. All right. So we're trying to figure out uh, why this happens, why each individual element gives off its own uh, characteristic emission spectrum creates different colors of light, you know, a simple way you could say it. And the first one to really uh, explain this uh, to a good degree was Niels Bohr, okay, and he came up with the Bohr model of the atom, which you've probably seen at some uh, level of the, um, you know, uh, some level of your education, okay? So here we had a nucleus, all right, all right. So let's say let's say this is our hydrogen atom. So we got a plus one. We got a nucleus. Are you? I am. It's way down there though. <laughs> okay, a plus one. That's not even a good plus one. That kind of looks like an H. It's supposed to be a plus one. Okay. So what he said was, here, I'll fix it. How about I do this? Okay, here's the nucleus of hydrogen. Better? All right. Okay. And he stated, Niels Bohr stated, that electrons orbit the nucleus in specific orbitals. And we still use that name, you know, when we talk about, you know, S and P orbitals, okay? Um, and they can only exist in these orbitals. And we'll even just quickly start to call them energy levels, okay? So they can be energy, electron and N equals one. Okay, there could be an orbital n equals two. And now you're gonna get to see my circle drawing skills. Oh, 
that's why I want to do it on here. I want to do like a half circle, but anyways. All right, so the electrons can only orbit the nucleus in these specific stable orbits, okay? We now know that this is a little simplistic, okay? They occupy regions where there's a probability of finding the electron. They don't orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun. I mean, that's a good analogy. I mean, there's stable orbits for the Earth, there's unstable orbits, okay? So it'd be stable orbits for electrons, there'd be unstable orbits um, uh, in between, okay? So the electrons can only exist in these orbits, or these orbitals, all right? But they can get promoted or excited to higher orbitals or higher energy levels, okay? So how do you do that? Well, the atom, absorb some energy. Okay? We know from the law of conservation of energy that that energy has to go somewhere, right? Where is that energy going to go? Well, it turns out when an atom absorbs energy, one of the ways it can, one of the places it can put that energy essentially is it can move an electron from one energy level to a higher energy level. Right? That's where that energy can go. Okay, so if you're at n equals one, suddenly that atom absorbs some energy, the electron can get excited to the higher energy level, all right? So the electron gets excited to n equals three. So we say atom absorbs energy. Okay, so now it's at n equals three. Is that uh, energy, is it higher potential energy or lower potential energy? Higher. higher, because it's further away from the nucleus. The higher the energy level, the higher the potential energy level. Okay, so what else do we know about that, uh, or what else could we infer from that, okay? If we've got an electron in a higher energy level, would we say that's stable or unstable? Unstable. The higher the potential energy of something, the less stable it is. Okay? So guess what happens? Eventually, that electron falls back down. It comes back down. Okay? And it can do so any which way. It can go from 3 to 2. It can go from 3 to 1. But it can't go anywhere in between. It's only going to go to another energy level, or orbital, as Bohr would have said. Okay? So then, so this is number 1. Atom absorbs energy. But if it goes to another um, orbital, like, out, like further away, mm -hmm. it also orbit faster. Like, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think the speed of the electron has a lot, is pretty complex. Um, it has to um, do with the repulsion from other electrons, kinetic energy, temperature of the atom. And so I don't know. Maybe, maybe but it could. Maybe mm. kinetic, maybe it could, some of that energy could be transferred to potential and kinetic energy, perhaps? I don't know. Does that one that gets excited happen at the same time as the one that is unstable? Like, do, like, do they happen at the same time? The so this is all one electron. This is just one electron. One. Yep, so first it was down here, yeah. n equals 1. Now it, it absorbs some energy, n equals 3. Now, second thing, an electron falls back down. Falls to n equals 2. All right, so... So basically it can never go back down from... No, it can go, it can go to 1. Oh, okay. Actually, just in this example, I say it's going to go down to 2. Okay. All right, but it could go to 1. Right. Still these questions, nobody wants to wave. So that's what, so it could, it could happen from photons. So an, an atom could absorb energy via photon or uh, in lamps and lights, it's just absorbing the energy via electricity, flow of electrons bumping into the atoms. Okay. So yeah, that energy can come from other, any place. Photons absorbing light. All right, so the electron fell back to N equals two. I didn't draw it, but it's there, okay? You're going to need that in a little bit. 
Okay, so now the electron's in n equals 2. All right. But while that is falling down, okay, we're going from high potential energy to low potential energy. We're going from, we can make up numbers, 100 joules to 50 joules. So what essentially happens? This atom lost 50 joules. The energy has to go somewhere. We know law of conservation of energy. Where does that energy go? Okay. Light. Light. It comes out as light. Okay. When electrons fall from high potential energy to low potential energy, so when they go from higher energy levels to lower energy levels, they emit photons. Okay. So this process of electron coming down, what do I want to say? Do, do, do. The third thing that happens is that a photon, light, is emitted. And usually when you saw light, you usually saw H nu. So H nu from energy equals H nu. That's how you can symbolize a photon. A little circle with HV. Okay. A photon is emitted. And the wavelength and frequency of this photon is determined by the energy of this transition. Hydrogen has only one n equals two uh, energy level, only one n equals three. There's so much energy in between those energy levels. So whenever an electron falls from three to two, it's going to emit a photon with the same wavelength of light every time. Okay? If it falls from three to one, it's going to emit a different wavelength of light. It's still going to emit a photon, but now it's going to emit a different wavelength of light because it's a different energy transition. Okay? Which one would be a higher energy transition, falling from 3 to 2 or 3 to 1? Okay, so that would be a higher energy transition. So then we'll have to eventually um, relate that back to wavelength shortly. Okay. Well, when you say more light, um, so they're both are going to emit one photon. Every time this happens, one atom will emit one photon. Okay? The difference between those photons will be the energy, and then eventually we'll be able to track that to frequency and wavelength. But I'll have to set up that relationship. <coughs> All right, so that's the uh, Bohr model. And that is actually a pretty good, at least simplistically, um, understanding of how light is emitted. Okay? Atoms absorb energy somehow, some way. Okay? The energy goes into electron transitions. They get promoted to higher energy levels. Then those electrons are unstable. Guess what happens? They fall down. When they fall down, they emit um, light. Same thing in here. The atoms in this room. We said the mercury. So the mercury is absorbing the electricity primarily. Um, as soon as I stop giving them, let me do this right. As soon as I stop giving them energy, guess what? The electrons aren't getting excited. They're all back down to the ground state, lowest energy level. If I start giving them energy again, boom, they start emitting light again because they get promoted to higher energy levels, fall down. Promoted to higher energy levels, fall down. Higher, lower, fall down. Whole time. 